Human life is worthless. They were always going to die, with or without a delusion. There's nothing you can do now. <laughs> it's such a farce. You have to see the funny side. Welcome to all human sacrifices, deaths, and losses in Genshin Impact's lore. A video that I have been wanting to make for quite some time now. I believe that human life is beautiful because it is temporary. But of course, sometimes the loss of life isn't a peaceful departure. Disclaimer. The term human sacrifices here is used as an umbrella term, but everything in this video will contain the following. Mass loss of life. Non-consenting loss of life. Human life as a sacrifice. Punishment through death. And other atrocities that fall under the same theme of bringing death to others for whatever gain. Please be warned as well that this video will be containing heavy topics. Additionally, most, if not all the points here will fall under lore and analysis, meaning that they have already been confirmed in-game to be the case. I won't be hypothesizing about future character deaths or any of the like. Let's begin. The old civilization of the Ice Age of Teyvat was known to have close ties with the envoys of Celestia, directly hearing their prophecies from those sent from the sky. The old civilization was promised great wisdom and prosperity. However, they were not satisfied with the answers the gods give. They schemed for more, and some led them to the silver tree in the ancient ruins. According to the prayer's artifact set, priests adorning crowns of silver branches would be sent into the ancient ruins to find enlightenment. These priests would be sent into the deep places of the world, to antediluvian ruins and long-buried altars of sacrifice. There they would meet the end of their days and find the secrets of the earth within the mountain of white branch crowns seated under the large silver tree. The people of the Lion's Tooth are children of Murata who made their way to Mondstadt. The children of Murata are a hardy people, blessed with a head of fiery red hair. They were taught that to survive, they must be willing to engage in the art of combat. In a winter ten years ago, the clan was hounded by Ursa the Drake. However, their clan was bought by the House Lawrence, who made a contract with Vanessa. According to the contract, she needs to win 12 battles and they will give her people freedom. However, the battle she signed was but a sacrifice, for they would be battling Ursa the Drake. The master of the Lawrence clan had no intention of letting her live, and instead, he promised the Great Earth an offering for lasting peace. Despite Vanessa's attempt to save her people and return them to the city, they were immediately shot down by archers for trying to save themselves. The aspect of human experimentation is a morbid crime to the natural order of the world. However, the Fatui do not care. In the underground arena known as Heresies, at least 139 contenders were killed during their experiments. However, because the contenders were insufficient, the Fatui required more. Such experiments were under the supervision of Dr. Krupp, a scientist under Ildatora's division. By using their power and influence, they went to the city of Mondstadt under the invitation of Diluk Ragnivindir. The Fatui had intended to request for Mondstadt's children to be brought with them under the guise that they will be recruited into the Fatui. According to Dr. Krupp, Mondstadt has plenty of fateful youths. Those they recruit from the city will be trained with the Fatui to become heroes in their own right. Kaya tells him that this simply sounds like a blood tax paid with the lives of children. Dr. Krupp told him that was not the case. Sel Vindagnir was once a flourishing mountain kingdom. The civilization flourished with its blessings, yet for unknown reasons, the city in the sky would set the civilization to perish. The Skyfrost Nail would soon be brought to destroy the civilization. The head priest, Varuk, died while trying to climb the peak of Vindagnir. Yet after the nail that froze the sky over descended upon the mountain, the festive site where priests ascended to face the heavens can no longer hear its voice. 
nor will those priests ever return again. While exploring Dragonspine's land entombed, the traveler finds several journals of an ancient investigation into the entombed city. This was an expedition ran by an unnamed person, and they and their colleagues traverse the ice and snow in search of what happened to the old civilization. There are three notable people mentioned in the journals. Master Eberhardt, Master Landrich, and Master Ingbert. All are members of Monstadian aristocracy. Master Eberhardt was the illegitimate heir to a noble house, while Master Ingbert was the legitimate one. Master Landrich told them that no matter what difficulties, they must press on. During their journeys, they find a secret locked chamber, and according to the text deciphered by Master Eberhardt, the chamber should contain impressive ancient frescoes along with weapons forged from star silver. According to Master Ingbert, the secret chamber could easily contain the most significant archaeological discoveries and decades. However, the author was unsure of their safety, given that they had lost numerous companions in the snowstorm just days before. Master Eberhardt only tells him that they are aristocratic children and that they are capable of making their way back to camp on their own. The author is unsure of this. A tragedy befalls the adventuring team, and in the second log of the journal, the great doors to the chamber would not budge. A cave-in had happened in the front of the large doors, and they had lost another adventurer due to the collapse. Upon returning to the south base camp, there was still no signs of the other who had gone missing in the snowstorm. The streak of misfortune had caused the author to grow restless and bitter, but he recognizes just how resilient the other masters were. Eberhard maintained a level head and Landridge's judgment seemed to be quite well-founded. The author states that when the storm eases, they will proceed to the cellar in the southwestern ruins. However, the second journal reveals that these aristocrats would send those that disappoint them down into the gladiator arenas to perish. The author wishes not to meet the same end. The third log of the investigation seals the fate of the party. The author writes it with knowledge that this will be his last as he succumbs to the severe cold and rapid blood loss. Eberhardt's plan of returning to the room failed. Or rather, it succeeded. Because it seems that he was the cause of the sudden cave-in, and that he had intended to betray his companions for the chance of succession. Only at the very end did he lead Master Ingbert and the author into the cellar in the southwestern ruins. Master Eberhard took out his polearm and silenced Master Ingbert permanently. All his talk of a lost civilization beneath snow was just a means to an end, and that he knew that Ingbert loved adventuring. In the end, this was all a ploy to reclaim Master Eberhardt's path to noblehood. The secrets of the room would be lost to them. Wuwang Hill is known as a mysterious place of spirits. Both innocent villagers and ignorant visitors alike are susceptible to the deception of the Wu Wang Hill spirits, which draw them deep into dark woods where thick mist blots out the sky and unknown dangers lurk in the shadows. Some take the form of bereavement of grief, others of regret, manifesting as voices and visages of the deceased, the love of the departed, or the remorse of another party in an unresolved dispute. The traveler finds themselves compelled to heed the spirit's cry and follow them into the depths of Wu Wang. However, Wu Wang Hill was not always this way. There was once a village that lived in Wu Wang, yet such has been abandoned. There is a fable about what happened to the young people of Wu Wang Hill. An enchanting, whale like song of a faraway monster drew the people of Wu Wang Hill, and one by one, they all threw themselves into the Baishu River. The tale of the God of Salt was a lost legend from the wars. Havria was not a powerful god, and could not have contended with the likes of Barbados and Morax. She did not seek out territory or power, but rather keep her people safe from the constant wars. However, Salterai will be known as her final resting place. She thought that by giving up before a fight could start, she could save herself and her people from the war. In the end, her people would spare her from the horrors of war, and instead kill her with a blade. But the god's power that flows forth when slain is beyond mortal comprehension. Those who could not flee from the god's final moments were transformed into statues of salt. 
immortalized forever in the ruins of their fallen god. Jueyun Karst is the abode of the Adepti. Few mortals may set foot here. Those that dare trespass their abode are rightfully punished. Mount Hulao's scenery is filled with large herbs, core lapis, and exquisite sights. But tread too far, and you will meet the wrath of the Mountain Shaper. Pray to the gods that you will not be swallowed by the amber rocks. Or don't. Even the Adepti will not heed your call. During the traveler's journey, they meet a catastrophe that befell Mingyun village. They meet someone named Uncle Dai, who explains that he and nine other workers were left to the mine. However, when they returned, four of their miners were missing. The missing man would traverse deep into the roots of Nanqian Min, hearing the ominous calls of a voice hidden beneath the earth. But they didn't know any better, for they only had one mission. Keep working, keep digging, dig farther, dig into the earth, even if it costs you your life. The sea is often a mysterious place for even the strongest of adventurers. The life it holds are almost unknown to even the gods. An example of this is a strange plant species known as the sea Ganoderma, a plant species that only grows in certain regions and islands of the ocean. Though it looks like a fungus of some sort, it actually comes from a substance secreted by certain soft-bodied organisms. In folk tales told in a certain land, these mouthless, noseless creatures are the transformed souls of children who died young. As a form of punishment, they must spend endless years absorbing the elements within the sand and sea using their fragile bodies, piling them up and forming sea Ganoderma. And once the Ganoderma are fully formed, they shall be harvested. Higi village on Yashiori Island was one of the areas worst affected by the ongoing conflicts between the Sangonomiya resistance and the Shogunate army. Washizu, the chief of Higi village, remained throughout to try and help his people to the best of his abilities. Washisu kept a diary of sorts in the incomplete notes, where he stated that both sides of the conflict did not seem to care for the plight of Higi village, only showing up to hand out propaganda for the respective side. After the Oribashi cultists destroyed the shrines protecting the inhabitants of Higi village, the residents slowly succumbed to the effects of the newly released Tatarigami. However, the beckons of the dead god would soon haunt Washizu, and he sat next to the shrine in hopes the gods will answer his prayers. His logbooks would tell the tale of a man who lost his village due to the greed of the cultists. However, it seems that not all of them died to the cultists. The possessions of the aforementioned people shall be left here as a lure, all the better to provide living sacrifices for his return. Choji's mother, around 32 years old, missing. He is pleased with her, and thus she must be found. Nameless Outlander, seemingly young, about to take the bait. The ancient tribe that lived in the island of the Thunderbird held Kanakapatsir to be its protector. The tribe would hold festivals in the Thunderbird's honor. However, in a ritual held by the shamans of the tribe, the ceremonial cup held the blood of the innocent. The priests have seen the Thunderbird give favor to a young boy's tunes. As such, it was only fitting that the altar should be stained in the young boy's blood, as a final sacrifice to the Thunderbird. However, the Thunderbird was not pleased, and the tribe was decimated to avenge the innocent one. The tribe was wiped from the face of the earth. The Fatui are cruel beings that cut weak branches the moment they come. Unfortunately, it seems they are willing to do it even to their own peers. The World Quest Clean House follows the plan of the Fatui and their goal of simply understanding what Archon Power could do to people. As stated, they saw Higi Village and Yashiori Island as nothing more than live datasets. Statistics that just happen to have families. Numbers on a paper, names on a grave. That's it. However, it is the morbid way that they are willing to silence anyone who knew of the Yashiori Island catastrophe that I find disgusting. Some Inazuman locals were willing to assist the Fatui. Those that simply needed money or wanted power neither the resistance nor the shogun could provide. 
the Fatui promise them that they will be recruited amongst their ranks, and that they should head to the port to be delivered to Snezhnaya for formal training. There they will meet an officer by the name of Borenka. However, when the traveler finds the notes, the situation becomes all the more dire. The new recruits do not have any innate value to the overall goals of the Fatui, and need not be trained in any way. They will, however, do just as fine as living test samples. The Fatui know no bounds in killing others for their personal gain. They were willing to kill their own peers, what more nameless children on the streets. Barnabas is a man under Ildatoria's division, in charge of understanding and studying the effects of Archon residue in a person's body. Archon residue is a substance in which delusions are created from, and the goal was to directly inject it into others. Sumerian children and people were the perfect candidates for the experiment. Constantly, the regent would be injected into them, and they would be subjected to severe pain, loss of control, and murderous and aggressive behavior. A survivor of these trials was a girl by the name of Kalei. She lived to tell the tale and see a brighter future. But what about those that did not? And last but not the least, is the descent of Celestia upon the pride of humanity. Conria was a nation built on militaristic pursuit and amazing technology, calling itself as a nation that did not need the gods. However, the travelers would be there to witness the sky turn crimson and the Eclipse dynasty falling to the war. However, while there are those that perhaps deserve it, what about the civilians who simply lived in the nation? The everyday citizens that had no intention or even knowledge of the growing hostility between Conria and Celestia? And what about the members of the Abyss Order who did not meet the kindness of death? The tale of Genshin Impact is not a pleasant one. There are even more topics that I didn't include here. The individuals who died to the monsters of the Abyss. Those that became corrupted and lost their lives because of the Abyss. The deaths in the Archon War. Those that lost themselves to the Vision Hunt Decree. And those that lost themselves to their delusions of grandeur. Death will come for all of us. And we can only pray that it'll come swiftly and painlessly. But after reading the tales of Devat, it is moments like this that you appreciate life just a little bit more. My name is Aster, and thank you for chilling with me.